State opens Chinese-owned shipyard at Coveden. President hosts festivities with First Lady to mark the beginning of Holy Festival and several key infrastructural projects are visited by the President. We'll have the details of these and other presidential activities in this week's edition of the Diary for the period February 28th to March 7th. I'm your host, Paul McAdam. The formal opening of the Xianghao shipyard at Coveden on the east bank of Demerara has been described as an expansion of Ghana's productive capacity by the president. The president was at the time addressing the opening of the Chinese-owned Xianghao shipyard at Coveden on the east bank of Demerara and also the launch and naming ceremony for a logging vessel christened the Yang Heng Freighter. Also present were Prime Minister Samuel Hines, Minister of Agriculture Dr. Leslie Ramsamy, and Chinese Ambassador to Guyana, Mr. Zhang Limin. I always believe that some of the best investments should go to our real economy. And this investment here will certainly help to stimulate a lot of other activities and allow us to use our rivers to cheapen transportation costs even more so that we can ply our rivers and do more kind of economic activity. As we speak, I am told that a lot of our work our infrastructural work and roads and so forth are held up because of shortage of stone. And now having a capacity here to build barges that will minimize the draft going into our rivers, I think that this can help a lot to stimulate the production and I hope that quarry owners, I see my friend Brian here, will invest in barges to bring out more and more um, stones so that we can continue the construction and building our country. The president noted that transportation has an important role to play in economic and social development. We have had a history too of constructing uh, ships. Um, many of you probably too young to know that the Malali and the Turani were manufactured at the then Proston's Wharf. And there have been others, but it has been an industry that was in decline for a long time. And I hope that this will stimulate shipbuilding, boat building, once again in our country. Chinese investors are also welcome, the president said, as he lauded that nation's development over the last three decades. That speaks volumes for Chinese investors, their readiness to take risks. And also it speaks volumes of their skills and speaks volume of their tradition and customs and their dedication to work and to labor. And that is something we hope that we can emulate in our country and become more productive. This is a, 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 a direction and an example that is being shown to us. We, we saw their work at the convention center we are seeing it now at the Marriott Hotel, the way they have produced and the quality of work that is being produced. We see it in the rest of the region, how much that they have invested. Right now, I just saw in Trinidad that there had been a big investment in the deep water harbor here, there. And we look forward to tell our Chinese friends that we are open to investment. It is also pointed out that government is grateful for the investments made and facilities will be put in place to encourage more potential business opportunities. Construction on the shipyard started in 2012, but it wasn't until the late 
2013 period that construction began on a vessel that is meant to facilitate the transportation of logs from Kukwani, where the company owns a logging concession. The vessel, whose design and engine are Chinese source, has its steel plates preformed in China as well. It has the capacity to carry some 200,000 tons of logs and six crew members. It will take about four days' journey from Kokwani to the shipyard at Coveden, fully laden. The Venezuelan Foreign Minister Elias Joa met with President Donald Ramatar on February 28. The Venezuelan minister landed at the Chedi Jagan International Airport, where he held a meeting with his local counterpart, Minister Karen Rodriguez Burkett, and other top officials. Discussions included the ongoing political and social unrest in the neighboring country, where over a dozen persons have been killed and wounded in violent street protests. You're watching The Diary, where we have been recapping the highlights of the country's president's weekly activities. More after the break. The modernization of the Justice Administration system, the MJAS project, has been completed through a loan from the Inter-American Development Bank. Achievements made under the project include amended and new laws, training for personnel within the sector, reduction of the severe case backlog, the refurbishing of courts, increased numbers of judicial officers and training, publication of law reports and their indices online, the establishment of a DPP office in Burbies, computerization of several connected systems, among other aspects. In an effort to respond more promptly to citizens, the Home Affairs Ministry has launched an online crime reporting system which allows citizens who possess or have access to cell phones, computers or other devices with internet connections to report criminal activities. Citizens can get instant access to security personnel on BlackBerry Messenger via 2804E429. Reports of corruption can also be made on www.ipaythebribe.com. These reports can be made anonymously. On March 1, President Donald Ramatar and First Lady Dialachmi Ramatar hosted a Chautal Samilan and Holy Sangam at the Ghan International Conference Center, Linyandal, to usher in the Spring Festival of Holi or Pagur. <laughs> Those in attendance, including Prime Minister Samuel Hines, several government ministers, and members of the diplomatic and religious communities, were treated to a medley of classic Bollywood hits and Chow Tal, the traditional holy melodies. The president, in a brief welcome remark, said that the customs and rituals associated with the celebration of the holiday form part of the unique Guyanese cultural mosaic for which the country is famous. I do hope that you will enjoy the program put forward. I know Vindi has given me a lot of credit for organizing this, and I want to admit to you tonight, I had very little to do with it. My wife did most of the work and the organizing in this regard. But I suppose that's one of the benefits of being president, that you get praise for some time than even things that you don't do. So I would like you to sit back. It's a wonderful program, a wonderful tradition with a beautiful message. As Vindi mentioned, Pagwa itself helps to create an indistinguishable set of people and forges and practices unity of all human beings, or, or of all mankind. And that is what we are struggling for today in our country and that is the world we are also struggling for because we want to celebrate the human being, the, the, the human personality. That is the, what we would like to celebrate and to look at all the differences as our strengths and the beauty that each brings and adds to this beautiful mosaic of our country and the world. So ladies and gentlemen, Sit back, enjoy, and I hope also that you enjoy 
the seven curry prepared for you. Festival varies every year as per the Hindu calendar and typically comes in March. This year it will be celebrated on March 17th. Meanwhile, the First Lady, the Lakshmi Ramatar, said that Pagwa also reminds persons that the season also commemorates good agricultural harvests and fertile land. The festival's significance leads back to the ancient story of a king and his son who wanted everyone to worship him, even his son. But the young man defied him and his father tried several times to kill him but failed. He then ordered him to sit on the lap of his demonic sister, Holika, on a pyre. But then again, good triumph over evil and Holika was burnt to ashes as Prahlad, his son, came out unharmed. Hence the significance of the burning of Holika on the eve of Holi. The day itself is celebrated in a carnival of colors when people apply powder, which is a beer, and a liquid dye, also with a back and throwing of water on the faces of friends, families, and close relatives. On March 2, President Ramatar, along with Minister of Public Works, Ropes and Men, and Finance Minister Dr. Ashney Singh, along with several engineers, visited and inspected works ongoing on the east bank of Damarara, the Forlin Road, and the Chedi Jagal International Airport expansion project. The CGI expansion project is expected to meet its deadline of August 2015 as works are scheduled to commence on several aspects of the buildings during the course of this year. The East Bank four-lane expansion has a June deadline. The President inspected three segments of the East Bank Road expansion at Moko, Little Diamond and Diamond's new scheme, where works are in progress and express satisfaction. I also had the opportunity to look at the airport project too. And that also seems that will bring us up to uh, our airport to push world standards. That is important for us. It was explained that there were some delays with the East Bank expansion due to several factors including inclement weather, the supplies of materials and the removal of utilities. According to Public Works Minister Robson Ben, improved weather conditions mean that works are progressing and the latest completion date is June month end. GIA's Chief Executive Officer Ramesh Gear said that the airport expansion project is proceeding as planned and the contractor is currently carrying out excavation work at the end of the runway. The excavation and backfilling works have started on a test section of 160 meters by 160 meters of the runway, which is about 10% of the expansion. And that in itself is 70% complete. Designs for a new terminal building and construction works will begin soon. The expansion will cater for a new terminal building with eight boarding bridges, elevators and closed circuit televisions. The runway will be extended by some 3,500 feet and there will be eight international parking positions. The 150 million US dollar project is funded by the government of China through the Chinese Exim Bank. Ghana was one of the stops for the Queen's Baton Relay. The Baton, which arrived on March 3, made its way around Georgetown, spending two days in the country. The Baton Relay in Guyana began on Main Street, where the head of state received the Baton at State House and, accompanied by his first lady, dear Lakshmi Ramatar, and their daughter Lisa, ran with it up to the Ministry of Culture, Youth and Sport, where it was handed over to Minister of Sport, Dr. Frank Anthony. I hope I would have um, given our athletes um, some encouragement by taking them. Uh, the Olympic flame, and hopefully, in this Commonwealth Games, we will bring home some medals. The Queen's Baton Relay is similar to the Olympic torch relay, and it's held around the world prior to the beginning of the Commonwealth Games. The baton carries a message from the head of the Commonwealth, the currently Queen Elizabeth II. The relay traditionally began at Buckingham Palace in London as part of that city's Commonwealth Day festivities. The Queen entrusts the baton to the first relay runner. At the opening ceremony of the Games, the final relay runner hands the baton back to the Queen or a representative who then reads the message aloud to officially open the Games. After departing Guyana, the Queen's baton went to Barbados. The need to create a better awareness of Islam and its contributions to development locally and worldwide was the focus of a visit to Guyana by Islamic scholar Mohammed Awal. 
The United States scholar of comparative religion is the guest of the Ghana Islamic Trust and paid a courtesy call on the president on March 6th. As you know, Islam is one of the you know, uh, uh, main religions all over the world. And if there's any religion I think that uh, needs to be explained today is Islam. Because around Islam we have a lot of misconception, a lot of misunderstanding and misrepresentation. So I think if there's any need, this is the time that we have to step up and do it. And it's, uh, Ghana Islamic Trust, Islamic Awareness Week that comes every year, like he said, I'm invited to come from overseas and to spearhead and to talk more about how to bridge the gap, how to bring the community together, how to coexist, as was what has been doing back then when Islam began. Today it seems to be something that, you know, it's not there. So we have to still be on the guard and bridge the gap and do the best that we can to bring or, or uplift the youngs that are coming today who eventually will be the leaders of tomorrow. So if there's any, you know, communicating and sowing together that kind of seed of uh, being together, then definitely we've made something good for the children to rise up and do. Mr. Awal was accompanied by acting head of the Ghana Islamic Trust, Mr. Abdul Alim Rahman, and other officials of the organization, and they have organized several events across Ghana to inform and educate persons about the various contributions made by followers of the religion, which is often viewed as the fastest growing on the planet. Usually every year around about March, we have what we call Islam Awareness Week. It's uh, basically 10 days where we go around the country uh, right, helping to raise the awareness of the meaning of Islam, what is really Islam and so on, to dispel, dispel the uh, misconceptions that people have about Islam all over the place. And so as part of these activities we have our international guest who is Mr. Muhammad Awal. He is the Ghana Islamic Trust hosted lectures at the University of Guyana and in communities such as Old Boyston and several schools including Queen's College. The overseas-based scholar will be departing Ghana on March 10. The staffers of the Office of the Presidential Complex were treated to roses courtesy of President Ramatar as part of observances for International Women's Day. Thanks to all of you, congratulations on International Women's Day. As the first lady mentioned, it's because it's tomorrow we're trying to do this today. So, uh, so because we're not working for <laughs> Some of us are working. Yeah, uh, and, uh, so we're going to it would must be a, uh, so we took the opportunity to, to want to express our appreciation for the work that you, the young ladies have been doing far beyond the, the call of normal duty, and we want to say how much we appreciate that. International Women's Day, originally called International Working Women's Day, is marked on March 8 each year. In different regions, the focus of the celebrations ranges from general celebrations of respect and appreciation and love towards women towards celebrations of women's economic, political and social achievements. It was started as a socialist political event, blending the culture of many countries, primarily European nations. In some regions, the day lost its political flavor and simply became an occasion for men to express their love for women in a way somewhat similar to a mixture of Mother's Day and Valentine's Day. In other regions, however, the political and human rights theme designated by United Nations runs strong and political awareness and the social struggles of women worldwide are brought out and examined in a hopeful manner. International Women's Day was first observed as a popular event after 1977 when the United Nations General Assembly invited member states to proclaim March 8 as the United Nations Day for Women's Rights and World Peace. The Walter Rodney Commission of Inquiry is to bring closure and not political mileage, says President. The long overdue Commission of Inquiry into the death of political activist Walter Rodney will bring some closure to an infamous event in local history. However, there is some amount of negativity emanating from the political opposition and the latter is being described as unfortunate by President Ramatar. I have decided to set up this Commission of Inquiry on the basis of an approach that was made by, to me by Mrs. Rodney, Mrs. Mrs. Pat Rodney who told me, uh, it, that was in late last year, that it is already, it was then 33 years since her husband uh, died. And she mentioned to me that it's a great burden on her that she would like to not, she herself would not like to go to pass away without having some kind of resolution on this matter. 
she appealed to me to she, at once again she she made the appeal to me that that to have a commission of inquiry set up she wanted to have this inquiry not to be um, affected by political considerations and she wanted to get to, to lay this matter to rest on um, and I think it's, it's probably very important for her conscience. I think it's also important for our country. Um, and all she wanted was to get to the truth. The Commission of Inquiry is being chaired by Barbadian Queen's Council, Sir Richard Cheltingham, with the others being Trinidadian Senior Council, Sina Chiram, and Jamaican Queen's Council, Jacqueline Samuels Brown. They were sworn in by the President on February 25. The Commission is hoping to have over 100 witnesses come forward in a process that will be open and free to the public and press. What we're putting in place is to allow people to come forward freely to express uh, those who have information to be totally open, that there will be no prosecution uh, against anyone. This is, not a, this is not something leading to try to... Um, to prosecute anyone for um, anything that was done in the past and that is why we have given immunity in this in this regard as far as the commission is concerned for people with information who can come forward and who could feel free knowing that they will not be facing any charges to, to come out and bring the truth out I think that was also um, Mrs. Rodney's desire and her, and her expressed position and I felt that I was in a position to I, I am in a position to to help um, our country's conscience on this matter or to know the truth on this matter and also I could not ignore the the um, the request of the wife the widow of this prominent Guyanese. The president is adamant that there is no political agenda. Mrs. Rodney specifically said she didn't want to have a political process in this regard and um, so therefore I have I never had any political agenda on this matter. The government doesn't have a political agenda on this matter. It was, this is a purely a technical issue. Um, when Mrs. Rodney made her request to me I put it in the hands of two of my uh, top technical people, in, um, Dr. Lunchan, Roger Lunchan, and uh, Anil Nandlal, our Attorney General, Minister of Legal Affairs, to uh, work and put this commission together. And this is, I, I, I am confident that the persons chosen are uh, capable people. Uh, who can carry out um, an inquiry. I think they all are experienced people as well. So I think that they have done a good job in, in the choice of their commissioners. Subsequent to the swearing-in, the commissioners met with Police Commissioner Leroy Brummel, Chief of Staff of the Ghana Defence Force, Brigadier Mark Phillips, and members of the Private Sector Commission. Dr. Rodney, political challenger to the then Forbes Burnham administration, was killed on June 13, 1980, when an explosive device that was concealed in a walkie-talkie radio detonated. The device was said to have been given to him by a former Ghana Defence Force sergeant who later fled to French Guiana, where he remained in exile until his death several years ago. The president is disappointed as he heads to a CARICOM heads of government meeting because of the nation's non-compliance with the anti-money laundering legislation. The President is set to participate in the 25th Intercessional CARICOM Heads of Government meeting this weekend. It is with some disappointment, however, that he is attending this event due to the failure of Ghana to pass its critically needed amended anti-money laundering legislation. This process came about from an international and a regional perspective. We are all the the countries all concerned had to have similar legislations. So the Caribbean has passed the legislations that are compliant with CFATF. It's very similar 
to the bill, to the amendment bill that we have in the National Assembly at this point in time. Um, so I think it is probably baffles a lot of my of CARICOM leaders to know because they know what, the, what would be the consequences of this and to not to have this bill supported. You know, up all the, in all the countries, these bills were supported by the government and opposition. And the most recent um, case in Belize, um, where Belize opposition came out to support them, and they were even pointing out about what was happening in Guyana and the dangers that Guyana face because of this terrible issue. So yes, I am, I would be disappointed. I am disappointed that I'm going without this. But also, I know that CARICOM will be concerned. He said that CARICOM will be considering the potential impact from the opposition's lack of support for the bill and its wider implications for the region. Knowing all of this, for the opposition to take this position, it's, um, it's extremely, it, it, it gives a clear picture that they just don't care about the welfare of the people of our country. And they just don't care about the economic growth and economic development. In fact, it's probably aimed in the opposite direction to retard these things from taking place. The stance taken by the political opposition, he added, is clearly not patriotic given the economic implications, some of which have already started to affect the local economy. On their insistence, the government invited Mr. Hernandez from the CFATF to come here. He spoke with a special select committee. He is, his position on the, on, on the consequences were, were clear. His position about the, the fact that we already have a bill that is CFATF compliant was very clear. And the fact that the, that the changes, the amendments that are being suggested by the opposition stands the danger of making what is compliant now uncompliant. He was very clear about that. He didn't only speak to the special select committee, he spoke to the press and that therefore in that way he spoke to the public and he also spoke to the private sector and with the same message that he was um, making to them all the time. So as I've said, it is not a question of the opposition not knowing what the consequences are. They have all the, that information uh, that was made public. And so they obviously have to have some other agenda. The bill, as is currently before the National Assembly, is in compliance with the standards and recommendations of CFATF and its parent body, the Financial Action Task Force. As such, the passage of the bill should be supported rather than exposing the country to the perils of international blacklisting, according to the head of state. That's all in this week's diary for the period February 28 to March 7, 2014. Before we go, these were some of the highlights. The head of state opens a Chinese-owned shipyard at Poverden. President hosts festivities with the First Lady to mark the beginning of the Holy Festival. And several key infrastructural projects are visited by the President. Do join us again for the next program when we will bring you more of the President's activities. I'm your host, Paul McAdam, thanking you for joining us. President delivers first address to the United States.